Hi, this is Matt Johnson. Uh, I'm recording this in Toronto uh, at the Zapruder office all alone. Um, and I'm going to uh, try my best to say as many relevant things about the making of this film, hopefully for uh, young filmmakers. Um, so if you are not one of those, you may find this commentary extremely uh, uninteresting. Um, but uh, but if you are thinking about making a first feature or making movies generally, um, incredible hopefully I say some things that are has been made useful to you. I, I remember being young and like desperately trying to figure out how to make a feature film and really not having any role models, mostly because of the era of, of filmmaking was really going through a major transformation from actual celluloid film into the kind of beginnings of the digital revolution that we're in now. And, uh, just as well as he could from and so it meant that all of the people who had kind of become young filmmakers from the generation before me had all done it in a much more standard model that is making more quote unquote normal movies. Um, I'm, and I'm talking about the norm, not the exception. Obviously, there's always going to be people who stand out. Um, and so, and so when I was making a my first feature, it, it, a lot of my influences actually came from uh, the internet, early internet, early YouTube, um, and early web series people, as well as uh, documentaries. Um, but it's a bit of a uh, diversion. I guess I should be talking more about this. All right, so the right away, um, I, I uh, put myself in this movie Mostly because I actually find it much easier to talk with actors and to talk with my team from from in front of the camera. And it's why in all my films, this one to a lesser extent, um, but in, in all my films, I'm kind of playing a person who pitches things. Like I'm always pitching or, or, or trying to lead like a ragtag crew of of, of people to do something seemingly impossible. And uh, I think it's, it's my comfort zone, much more so than uh, barking commands from, from behind the camera. I, um, I don't like that. Yeah, I, yeah I, find that, I find that very uncomfortable. Whereas when I'm uh, on camera, there's a kind of vulnerability that you have that uh, I think helps you uh, communicate with people. I really hate this shot. If that one of me standing, sitting down, that's a... Oh, man, I haven't watched this movie since we premiered it. And um, I'm, it's funny. All I see is the mistakes. But uh, I know not to bring those up because it makes me seem... Um, yeah. uh, repulsive. There's an office and should have This... Is something we sh reshot this entire sequence between me and Jay here, um, and the reason reason we reshot it was because when we first shot this sequence, we shot it much wider, and both that see the shot right there where I say Mark of the Beast, this is exactly what we were trying to do. We realized that right at the top of the film to have both Doug and Mike in focus in wider shots, it made the audience feel as though this movie was going to be about Doug. And it's because uh, Jay's character is so laconic and and it almost seemed as though Doug was running the show that for the camera to linger on him, sorry about that, um, it, uh, it, it was just very confusing. And so this was one of the things that we very quickly went back and reshot, and we shot it with one camera, and and Jared does this incredible bouncing back and forth just between um, Jay and I, except always keeping me out of focus. And that was um, they're outside. That was a decision we realized only because we were all living in the same house. If you listen to the other commentary track, it'll have the have most of the uh, production heads on it, uh, where we talk about that experience. But we would go back and watch all our footage together in the house at night, and it very quickly dawned on us that uh, that I had made a huge mistake. In, in covering that sequence. Uh, neutrally is the term. This is another reshoot with Glenn. Yeah, um, 
and the reason we reshot this is again for the same reason we're yes. shooting it too neutrally. Yes. This is something that uh, if you're a first time filmmaker, like it takes you so many days to get your sea legs and this thing doesn't go. We shot this movie more or less chronologically and I had no clue um, what I was doing for these first five days. Thank you. And I wish, I no, wish it, uh, that we had yeah. kind of done Apparently the Americans like, offered them some fancy tactics. Some low stakes <laughs> filming, like made, made, a, made a music video, yeah, shot a commercial, yeah, like done that. anything with the crew that was lower stakes before we went into yeah. this because uh, so many of these key moments, these key beats, I uh, I went back and reshot because okay. uh, uh, they weren't they weren't done the way that I wanted, the and, uh, and, and this this shot of Glenn is a great example of that. And uh, it's one of the horrors of shooting chronologically, is that you know your movie's going to open with this shit that 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 you've shot right away, and that's how you're establishing trust with the audience. And um, if that's really bad, then uh, well, yeah, you, you want to establish trust as quickly as possible. So if anything, you should shoot like your act to trash, just like fun and games garbage first, like stuff that if you screw up is not going to make that big of a difference because the audience is already, they either trust you or they don't. And then, uh, and then once you're comfortable, go back to shooting in order. I love that joke. Watch the fuck out. So this is one of Kurt, Law, the editor of this film's great, great genius tricks is he takes something from a scene that didn't work and you put it somewhere else and Glenn shouting, watch the fuck out. That is not what Mike and Doug saw out the window, right? We, we didn't see anything like that. It's a, it's a completely, in fact, that's an outtake where I go, oh shit, sit down. Okay, so I actually just decided to get Kurt Lobb, the editor of the film, to answer some of these questions himself. Kurt, what I was just talking about was how you took Jim. Oh, you got to turn down uh, the video. Like, it's way too loud. This is crazy. Okay, how's that? No, like, also, just, thanks. No, turn it down even. No, turn it down even more. Um, like this? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Um, how Jim comes in and says, "Watch the fuck out," as he. Uh, hey. As he's coming in, and how you you invented that, how that was not in the well. It's, it's, oh yeah, isn't that actually happening when he just first walks in? Like it's supposed to set him up when he's going to see Brock, right? Yeah, and I wonder if you want to talk about your technique of, uh, of throwing that in there. Well, of rearranging footage. Yeah, right? sure. Really, that moment I think I worked backwards from your reaction of "Oh shit, here he comes," whatever it is, and then you jumping away, and so it was like okay. What do we have of Jim that we can oh, fake oh, we being the thing that you're reacting to? And then that just worked perfectly, luckily. Oh, oh that's such an interesting idea. Yeah. Right. Because uh, well, so we didn't have coverage at that window of Jim approaching otherwise for that moment. No, no, no. What I'm referring to is the fact that, like, you discovered a problem. Mm -hmm. And that problem led you to rediscover old footage. Because something that I'm always saying to film students is, and you and I talk about this all the time, is that, is that like you have no idea what your footage is when right. you first shoot it. Because you will watch your raw footage immediately and think, like, it's good or bad or whatever. It doesn't matter what you think, but you think X. But then mm -hmm. as soon as you make a conclusion or discover something about your film, it recontextualizes everything you shot. And so that you can go back and look at the same footage again and be like, oh, my God, this is actually right. different now. Yeah. And so what, what you just said we do all the time where it's like we discover something like, oh, Matt's doing a funny reaction. We need something for him to look at. And then you look at everything again and the shot of Jim walking in being like, watch the fuck out, which before we thought was too big, stupid, yeah. pointless, now becomes the most brilliantly scripted beat in the whole first five minutes of the movie. That's right. Look at the camera. Getting a call. From Tristan. You better ignore that. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Tristan, if you're listening. Yeah, well, Trist um, Tristan is our, our VFX answer. supervisor, and we'll try to point out his work as it comes. But Tris, we can't answer the phone right now. He's because... got questions about the series. We don't yeah, know exactly. Like but yeah. yeah, you're totally right. It's funny how just like pushing through the edit, even if you think, you know, that you're close, it's like you just got to keep trying to unlock new things so that you can revisit 
old footage with a new lens and see, yeah, how you can repurpose it. It's one of the things that I love about working together is that I will have an idea of how I thought something was going to go. And then you, we never really talk about how something should be before you start cutting it. But because what you do is always so different, or at least sometimes it's so different than what I thought, then it lets me see the footage we shot in a new way. And I think mm -hmm. vice versa, because mm -hmm. one of the things I really love doing is like editing things and then showing them to one another, because I think it changes the way that we think about not only the movie, but about just the raw footage. Again, you get like... In the same way that the script is like the ultimate do. document for payroll, the director, the footage is, right. is all you have. And so you just need to become a slave to it. It's like the, 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 the footage is almost like the Bible or, or more, more, like, more like your alphabet. And so it's up to you to figure out how to use your alphabet as, as best as you can. Holy shit, the Blue Jays won 20 to 1 versus the Rays. Wow. Wow. Really? They just won 20 to 1. They're pretty good this year, yeah. Well, no, they just, they just got destroyed oh, no. by the Orioles. Oh. Did they? Oh, I thought yeah. they had a good record. They had a crazy win streak, like 12 or something in a row. Oh, Maybe. never mind. Uh, yeah, it's funny. All you have is the footage, that's for sure. And that's why, like, if we really had... I guess we did have a working good script on this project. Usually we don't. But it's kind of pointless to, like, freshen up on the script or something before you edit a scene because... All you have is is what they shot. Is what you got, yeah. All you, have, you have is what make. they shot. Yeah. In, in fact, I think or, the script. Or your imagination, if you're allowed to reshoot and suggest stuff, but yeah. But even that comes from the footage. That's right. Exactly. Like, even even your concept of, of reshoots has to come from the footage. Yep. Um, this this opening credit sequence is not not a good example of that, but you notice how. There's that old footage of uh, like VHS style stuff of the engineers. That happened. That was not meant to be in the movie. That was just BTS footage being shot by Pranay, one of the engineers, that he was shooting for fun in character. And then one day in Godrich, I think I was upstairs and I was looking at, through raw footage and I just saw this stuff and I was like, ah, we could probably use this. And then I remember that being a, a great day of celebration. Yeah, I think at that point we still had started cutting the opening credits just with archive and then that really was the key piece was the engineers goofing around and so much of that basically every like usable frame of that stuff is in the movie because if you look at the heads and tails of all those shots it's like a crew member walking around or whatever do you remember why i was looking at that footage in the first place i don't remember because we were trying to find any instances of me and mike Jay Baruchel, oh, like smiling, laughing, smiling, and, and laughing with one another. Because found it. in my infinite wisdom, I decided that these guys would be best friends, and we you would not shoot. It. We would not shoot any <laughs> scenes of them getting along, embracing, hugging, or smiling at one another. Which and we so, thought we learned our lesson from Operation Avalanche, but we didn't. Clearly not. Clearly not. Where like, the dirties is this like whole movie where look at these two best friends getting along, laughing, having fun, and then we thought everyone knows Matt and Owen are best friends. Let's show them separate at a certain point, and then we do it way too early in Op Av, in my opinion. I think yours as well. So you oh don't really God. feel that yeah you, yeah, you don't want to get into my, my, yeah. my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> anyway, it's funny. We kind of, I think we succeeded though with and stuff like that the opening credits footage and giving and, the feeling like these are buds. Well, I, we tried to basically create as many opportunities as we could to make these guys look like they were. Movie night. Right now, well, that they that they liked each other and that they, right. they had some loyalty. Here's a good example coming up. I remember sitting in the editing suite being like, "Oh, we should have had Mike stoked being part of this movie night, or at least like you know, it cheers him up uh, in this moment." But you're saying it's a, right. It's a good example of what we should have done. Should, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it, this what we have here is like showing, showing the alienation. D Doug's hand, and then. Yeah, this is an editing trick. Alan's so, hand. So look, I'm holding holding, the, holding it, and, but then you see it's actually Alan's hand, Ben Petrie's hand. I so did you, the I did this edit. I was I, I, I was the person who discovered that. You've uh, done a commentary already, so I don't know what you've already covered. The oh, it continuity was, mistake of the date and the hand. No, please. That other commentary was just basically everybody else getting um, credit for what they their, did. Their ideas. Yes. For their well, 
yeah, yeah. It was. Just if I a, start saying something that's been said, you just have to scream "stop" or something. If that you've already said. <laughs> no, like if if you guys said in the last commentary. We're not gonna we're not gonna cover any of the same ground. I promise. Okay. The whole thing was basically just stroking Jay McCarroll's ego. The whole. I was time. just gonna say. So this score by Jay. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And Jay being like, you know, I actually had a lot of suggestions for the story and and, uh, and directing, <laughs> and I actually said hey. more on say uh, you right. I think he did. I think he did. Were you there? On Were you on set even one day? I was there for one day. That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, I'm this, to... this is another thing where we're like, oh, is that strong enough? Just him looking at this board to make him go to this place. We're like, is that just like a cheap movie move? Yeah, he's or, looking or will at people this card. follow it? Yeah, we were going to do a reshoot where he like calls the guy from Ro- Ted Rogers. Was that the plan? Uh, yeah, I, I remember at the uh, with the rough cut of this movie, we planned to go back and reshoot all of this stuff with with both Glenn and Jay. And in the end, we didn't reshoot really anything. No, we had big plans. And then, did you talk about the one thing we did reshoot for the opening that we didn't use? No, we didn't talk. You, well, we, maybe we'll talk about that when we get to that we get shot. There. Yeah. Bobby did the first edit of this, right? You gotta bleep that. Of red, of red alert. Yeah, well, you know what? I gotta also give a special shout out to the uh, assembly editors, Manny Hussey and Carly Williams, that uh, were cutting this stuff as it was coming in during the shoot, because I was working on a different project at the time. So they were just kind of, as stuff was rolling in, they were doing these quick edits just to show us what, kind of what we had, um, which was super helpful. Well, I, I think it was when, even beyond helpful because yeah. kind of like what we were talking about earlier, having a so quickly s- like scraped together market, version of a scene is a much better starting position than having nothing. <laughs> yes. And if, and if you are out there making yeah. like a, I will leave my job a first feature or a short film, you make me CEO. I feel your pain when it comes to getting that first draft or assembly or whatever together because you don't want to face the footage my advice and what i have started to do have somebody else who is not as invested in the outcome as you do the first pass of something because then it's almost like the band-aid has been ripped off in terms of you facing Mm. your own failure and and then Okay. Well, I'll talk about this, uh, Blackberry. Then Kurt and I and Bobby were able to sit down and watch the whole movie and react as opposed to create. And I think reaction is a much easier emotion. Uh, it's a much easier psychological place to be in, like the reactive judgment brain, than the creative, like it's all on your shoulders, perfectionist brain. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's just way easier and then you can look at what works and then rather than creating the story you're actually modifying it to be better you guys are getting fucked why would you and yeah i'm not so great at that first part of the process either like knowing that something is just rough and you're just throwing it together so you can work on the next thing the next day like that's a certain skill that yeah, I, when I'm cutting something, I find it hard to just you know leave it and move on. But it it's so helpful when you have people that are doing it for you. Well, it, it, it really, unless you have to, it doesn't make sense to do it at all because it's a totally different part of your brain that mm-hmm. does first drafts of things. A totally different part of your brain. Mm-hmm. And and if, in case you can't tell, like guys, uh, both Kurt and I think of editing not as like really a today technical job it's much closer to writing um because as we said before the script is meaningless to an editor only the footage has meaning to an editor um they are rewriting the movie with the footage obviously and we've always taken the approach that it doesn't matter what the intention was stanley kubrick has got a great line that i'm going to butcher which is that you know the director of a movie hates the writer and the editor of a movie hates the director because they've just been handed all this trash. And in, in, in Kubrick's case, he, he normally is all three of those people. But mm-hmm. um, but you don't we take that all the way. There's no, there's nobody who gets more hate during the edit than me when we're watching footage and just watching all the things that I've screwed up. I'm mocked endlessly for just about every bad decision I make. Um, and you need to be able to do that because the point isn't – to do exactly what you intended to do on set in fact that Mm -hmm. would be a horrible movie if Mm -hmm. if 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 you could freeze my vision 
I sassed him. On set in any of these days and release that as a film, we'd be looking at a real piece of shit right yeah. now. The key is to grow into, into the, the, the footage that you shot and figure out how to turn that into something compelling. Mm-hmm. And you just hope to God you weren't, you weren't so fucked over by your director that, uh, that there's something. And you need to be able to – you need a relationship with your director or with whoever's in charge of this where you ultimately have the power to do whatever you want. Yes. Because otherwise, I mean, Kurt, how many times – yeah, you won't talk about any specifics I imagine. But I imagine the, the being in a situation where you know the answer or at least you have a pathway to fix it and you can't would be quite painful. Yeah. Big time. Yeah, that's what's nice about working with people that you've worked with in the past, too, and having relationships with, like, that they can trust you, and you can make some big swings without being worried how they might react, you know? About or hurting their like, feelings, yeah. Yeah, or, yeah, that's big. Or them being like, what, this isn't what we wanted, you know? Um, I feel like, yeah, when I work with someone for the first time, maybe I'm trying to guess what their intentions were a bit more than... Like if I'm working with you guys, where I'm just trying to do what I think is best and then showing you, you know? I really thought you guys had a fact. Well, it's so funny. The idea that the idea of doing anything other than what's best is so Well, that's crazy. the only thing so you can crazy. do, really, right? It's yeah. like, no, I mean my own instincts. Like, yeah, but I, I suppose I still do that. Yeah. Like you know what? That's not version. true. That's not true, though, because how many times have you even thought, like I think about um, like if you were like making your own film, you don't think that you'd have uh, kind of what if there's an actor who like was really, really cared about a line that they gave, you know, what? or or a performance like mm-hmm. like I think it's good that you have that distance where you can be yes. like, ah, this this actor just sucks and you, you don't know them like you don't care. So you just yeah, cut out time. Their, you cut out their entire performance. Big time. I know, too, like in the past. <laughs> I've cut a scene and someone have been, has been like, oh, isn't this weird? Like the continuity, like the door is actually over here and blah, blah, blah. Because they were on set when it was shot. And I'm like, I didn't know that. All I see is what's in this footage. I had no idea. And, and that's so another me, amazing lesson for, for filmmakers who are listening to this hey, is Steve, Steve? Huh? do not get Steve hung up on. Some guy's trying to say Nunian soon. Well, what would you even call that? It's like, yeah. it's like, not quite continuity, but it's like on the knowledge that you have of what the intention was. Because you were there on set, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll fuck you over so badly because then you, you're not, oh, how would you say it? Like, you're not dealing again with the footage. The footage, yeah. the footage is God. You're, using, you're dealing with privileged information that you have that the audience does not. Is literally sketched out. Literally sketched out. I think I edited this scene too because – you can tell. Look at how bad the, my uh, transitions are from cut to cut. <laughs> look I at that. You wanted to put a big ass long whatever it was in the opening of the scene. I forget what it is now. What was that? Uh, remind me. I'm, I, oh, I, uh, what's the saying? Susang. Whatever. Su-sang. Su-sang. Oh, the, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. One one of the dangers it, when I'm acting, I'm I'm basically just talking pure nonsense as much as I can, and trying to play games with words. And a lot of what we wind up doing in the edit is taking all of my brilliant dialogue out. Right. Although this is a good scene. I've always thought this one was funny. You funny. Was I, I hate coming this after scene. this one. Yeah. I, want, I wanted to cut the scene out of the Day movie. one, you said take this out. But I was like, what? How's the next scene going to play? $100,000. If we don't set it up. Fucking mind. I look at 100,000 deals a day. This is something I kept. No, I look at 100 deals a day. Yeah, you didn't stumble in the other take. I remember, uh, yeah, I remember somebody tried to cut out that. We should have stayed on me the whole time, I think. But uh, again. Uh, 25% for 250000 50 bucks. One of my favorite lines in the movie. Thirty-three. Yeah, you always say that. I don't get it. Fifty percent <laughs> for funny. fifty bucks. That's <laughs> that funny. Run the company with me. My job. No. We yes. Deal. I love that. Where the real, where Doug is able to act in both in character and out of character at the yeah, same yeah. time, and then still have a very <laughs> relaxed attitude at the end. After, yeah. Here's another fun trick we did in the edit. I don't think it was written with the intention of like a misdirect for the audience or like a reveal that this was just a rehearsal, right? Where then we cut it as though. You could buy that Mike is on the phone with Jim. I remember to hold. that. And it's because that was one of the, the, the keys of shooting it so close that we were able to hold on that shot of Jay before yeah. we reveal that, uh, that uh, Mike is there. Sorry that Jay is there, yeah. Yeah. 
Hi, Jim. It's uh, Mike Lazaridis from Research in Motion. We met at the office the other day. It was also hard find, finding the right way to cut this, you know? Well, like cutting to Jim being silent always kind of felt funky. So we until we, hopefully it doesn't anymore, but it took some work. Well, that's because the audience doesn't realize that there's an entire scene happening at Jim's house. That's right. Did yeah, you go much into that about the other character? No, we didn't. This is a good time to talk about just all the things that have been cut out. So there's an entire storyline occurring sure. in this room. If you just expanded the frame maybe 60%, you would see that Jim is there with his wife who he's just shooed away and there's all of this mm -hmm. back and forth drama going on yeah. between him and his home life. That, and he's um, got the severance check. And he has a severance check for exactly the amount of money that these guys are asking for, which is true. Which is so funny because that's one of those things that actually did happen between Jim but, and Research Motion. But it's so unbelievable in a movie. The it's so goofy, yeah. That we were like, oh, we just have to cut all this. It's horrible. Yeah, because he's holding the check when he gets the phone call. Yeah. But again, thank God we don't have to deliver what's in the script. That's right. You know, it's funny too with this movie. Definitely because it was like more drafts of the script, and everyone went into it knowing it was going to be way more scripted than past projects but it's funny how usually we go out and we shoot something and then we're like oh man is any of this stuff making sense like we gotta go reshoot and make stuff make sense where this movie was way more like let's take stuff out there's too much too much like him with the severance check and all this stuff you know uh, uh, I feel like it's, that's it's because the script was overwritten like we the script was so overwritten because I had not realized the power of of someone like Glenn and Jay's ability mm. to convey plot with just their faces. I completely yeah. did not understand how that worked. Um, I was so used to the kind of mawkish, explicit <laughs> acting yeah. and dialogue yeah. that we'd been doing in Nirvana the Band and Operation Avalanche and the Dirties. Mm -hmm. and, and then all of a sudden you get these real actors who can convey all this stuff without dialogue. And I think what it meant was in the end we probably cut uh, sorry, 30 or 40 percent of the movie out right how, how, how yeah many? maybe i don't know i mean three hour cut yeah. initially so then a third yeah a third crazy so we cut a third of the movie a third of what we shot in terms of finished scenes yeah or out, out, out of the movie or yeah condensed scenes way down but you know with having all that extra stuff we definitely repurposed certain shots and everything you know oh dude so it was good to have all that of course sitting there. yeah there's no, there's no shame unless unless you're like spending money like crazy on mm. your days there's no shame in overshooting because again if you're if you're if you're approaching the edit with the right frame of mind all footage is useful kurt what was that that great thing that you said about um what you wish directors would do I want to talk about these modems. uh on on set you wish that you would that a cinematographer would just take a camera point it in random directions and just, oh, yeah. keep... just get a bunch of stuff get a bunch of footage of the whole room of the actor doing anything which is kind of what we used to do um, yeah and in some ways yeah, blackberry is like this yeah but the but idea the being times... you just you, you never know what you're gonna need like just a yeah. shot of an actor like touching a wall with his hand or like <laughs> yeah. a shot of Glenn leaning against a car. I remember at one point we yeah. really wish we had, like you just don't know. Mm -hmm. Things can be recontextualized in all kinds of crazy ways. So if you have time on set, how long to build a program? Just shoot nonsense or what would seem like nonsense because you have mm -hmm. no idea how useful that could be to you. Mm -hmm. Even with like VFX and stuff too. I ran into that a lot where it's like, oh, I want to like show a certain side of the room or something. We just didn't Listen, get it. U.S. Robotics is building their own phone. We are now in a race to get this thing to market. And we are I remember editing the scene being a nightmare. Get these fucking nerds. Yeah. And this is one of these scenes where it stayed in an early draft for a long time because we kept having all these uh, test screenings that we had to prep cuts for. And when the movie was long from being ready to show and but we were so we'd always make a priority list of like okay what scenes really need work and here was this was one that was like okay enough that we could leave it so for so long it was just garbage given the love it needed yeah i remember um, that first test screening that we did in toronto at the queensway this scene was just its original alpha form yeah so painful 
Dude, it was getting love. The laughs. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I know it played well, but <laughs> what you're going to try? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, it's not even worth defending. It, no, it, maybe it's a, a good time to talk about test screening things That's because for we test screened this movie probably more than anything I've test screened in the past. Yeah. Definitely. That's how it felt. I felt yeah. the same way, and I found it hugely useful. The, yep. the great thing about test screening that a lot of people don't okay. know, right. and if and if you are a filmmaker again, listen to this. You should you should not be afraid of test screening things, but don't do it to get feedback. Like don't do the test do it screening for yourselves. Yeah, do it for yourself. You t mm -hmm. screen the movie in front of a bunch of strangers or people that you trust or whatever, and just sit there and feel the room. And then you will know the answers. God will speak to you through their misery. <laughs> and you won't need to ask them any questions yeah. when it's all over. That's, just, yeah. Like even that first test screening, it really was consistent laughing. But it was still torturous because we were seeing all the things that needed so much work. And uh, yeah, it, it was a funny feeling leaving being like, oh, you guys got a great score from the audience. But there's so much work to do. It was, it was a unique feeling. Mike! Yeah, the movie probably changed close to 100% <laughs> from what that first screening was versus what we screened in Berlin. And then after Berlin, we we, we made, what, 100 changes? Yeah, there was a lot. I mean, a lot of them were smaller than others, but we took out two minutes, changed a bunch of, like, music cues, and, yeah. It was like a week of work between Berlin and the final final Get edit John Woodman at Bell yeah. we did nine picture locks what are you doing? <laughs> nine times we thought we were done yeah it was uh, at the end the the project uh file was called uh blackberry final 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 That's final right. final final copy. final final yeah copy copy final final copy <laughs> hi this is Jim Balsillis so this is another big writing motion. error never have two scenes Back to back in closets. In the room, on the phone. <laughs> on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> we were coming for, yeah, the earlier scene. Too I wanted to cut it out completely. I wanted yeah. to completely cut out the first scene. Yeah. Okay. I got I got talked off the ledge. I got what talked off the ledge. Yeah. This was another scene that was a wait, total wait, piece wait, of wait, shit. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, another one of these. Mr. Woodman, okay enough. Insanely rich. It was the enemy of good? Yeah. Humanity? Dude, good enough was, the, was, was the enemy of this fucking movie. The This... <laughs> He just we should talk about the shooting style briefly because I think that it may not be obvious, as my character just said, um, why the shooting style is so addictive to us. And it is not, not just the aesthetic. Like, yeah, it is nice to feel like you're in the room and there's all kinds of pretentious things that I like to say about uh, documentaries, that we, why I do it. But the one of the deep, dark truths is that when you shoot two cameras that in sort of a handheld style, it means you can cut almost anything with almost anything. Mm -hmm. And we would not be able to tailor our stories as well as we do. And this movie would not feel nearly as snappy and interesting. And the acting would not be one-fifth as good if we could not cut absolutely every best moment we wanted with every other best moment we wanted. And the only way to right. achieve that is by shooting dual coverage at the same time with cameras that have enough mobility to them that the audience is not going to bump against them being smash edited mm -hmm. back and forth with one another. And so it, it, it seems like a cost that we pay, like a like an almost aesthetic cost. Like our movies all wind up looking like you know barbecued documentaries. They look <laughs> like kind of garbage in a way if you don't like this aesthetic. Yeah. But they, the the back door that it lets us go through in terms of storytelling is so big and beautiful that that it's very difficult to give up. I think I've heard people say when I've done a project outside of this group, they're like, "Oh, it looks like a real movie." No, no. And I'm so how do you like that? Right? Like uh, this movie looks like a real no, movie. the other movies I've done, but I think this one, yes, yeah, it's right. been a good mix suddenly of uh, looking kind of like a real movie oh. and being our style. And yeah, for the most part, it seems like people right. are complimentary about how it lends itself to the feeling of the movie. But yeah, how many times can you get away with that, man? Well, we're gonna find out. Uh, yeah, maybe one more. <laughs> yeah, maybe one more. Look, as, as soon as um. 
um, I learned how to write a movie, I won't need to do it anymore because we mm. won't need to completely rewrite it in the edit. <laughs> so, That's right. So, it's just, yeah, it's so much easier to get stuff like this shot. Okay. I mean, the camera can just go wherever you need it to. Like, exactly. What are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, how are you? Even even the shot of them driving in. This editing this sequence. Like this was an MJ. Uh, I wasn't gonna. I was gonna bring it up in that sense. But what I was gonna say is that this is the type of thing that we love, which is you shoot a bunch of like random improvised stuff and have your actors just kind of behave in the in the mm -hmm. environment, and you do that over the course of many days. And then what it allows you to do, which is what the sequence is all about, is then cut that shit with other random stuff in your movie that w didn't quite fit. I'll show you a great example. So right here, this soldering. Cool little imagery, yeah. This was never meant to be a part of the, they're not, no. th this is not also, meant. this is great, this moment. I remember when you showed me this, when you found it, just. So that, that they're shot. They're really talking about a chat room. They're talking about a chat room. So they're, that guy, so Michael Scott, that that brilliant actor with the glasses who plays a character named Scott is just reading dialogue from a chat room. That's because, someone else said, right? That somebody so else guys. said. It's and so be, funny. But because it's so arcane technical, yeah, yeah. and technical, I could cut it in and it would seem like they were talking about building a prototype. <laughs> What's saying? Yeah. And it just seems so real. Another fun fact about that sequence is we kept trying to cut it like MOS with a needle drop and so we weren't we were only cutting based on the visuals and not the audio and then we're like ah maybe we just don't put a song in or we put score in but then it felt so empty having an mos so we just turned the audio tracks on all these cuts that we already made and then we're like whoa this is wicked cutting off their sentences like halfway through makes it sound so much more real well than, it, f it feels like how it actually feels to stay up all night working on, on work yeah work on something. Yeah. yeah and you guys sound a lot more like you know what you're talking about when you don't have to finish your thought it's that's just a that's, little a, tiny that's a huge Nirvana the band trick that yeah. that we would always use whenever Matt and Jay were like performing or like singing or something like that. If you cut if you cut off the actors while they're still on their high, yeah. then they seem much more competent than mm -hmm. if you let them finish their their thoughts. Who, this who, window did, reaction. Did, did you did you come up with that or yeah. did Bobby? Yeah, no, it was me. I think I was by myself at that point, late in, late late in the edit. And I was pretty excited. I don't know why we decided. Yeah, I think he really wanted. Like why we didn't use it earlier, but yeah, well, because it was never shot. Like that's just me looking out the window to see if the crew's still shooting me, right? Like yeah, it's supposed to just be used at the tail end, which we do use it as when you're a sad man. But that really is you just you've done your take for the end of the scene, and then you're peeking your head back to make sure it's all good. Okay, great. <laughs> which there really isn't that many of those in this movie compared to what we usually do, but that's one of them repurposing something real well and that's that's kind of your prankish uh personality coming through right because, because you you love to humiliate me i know getting one over yeah yeah and you love it when you can take something that i did not mean to do yeah. and put it in the movie in context to make me just look like, like a genius like, no like a moron quite right. literally um yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's a stock shot should we say that? Oh, sure. We've had yeah. too many right. secrets. Look. We're letting them all out? Well, we can let them all out, sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. okay, okay. So that's not Jay's real hair. Boom. <laughs> 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 I love... So when I came up with this um, track even, to use for this montage... It. Don't even try it. MJ, I don't think, had even heard of Slint. Or did don't, you know? Don't even try it. I don't didn't even, like this Don't even try it. Now I love it. Yeah, this is, <laughs> I, I had to hold on to this track for dear life. Like my knuckle, my knuckles were. Well, the white. first one I put in was uh, "Loser." It was great. Yeah, we, we were trying to get, get Bex. We're trying to get Bex "Loser," and he would wouldn't wouldn't give it up. Wouldn't give it no. up. We begged. We wanted "Loser" to be the opening credits, and then when we found yeah. "Elastica," which is a great great move. Did you yeah. talk about how you guys shot this oh. in the last one? You must. Yeah, have. yeah, yeah. We yeah. talked a little about shooting on a stage. It, 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 as far as this conversation goes, yeah, like whether you're shooting on it's a, over. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 like shooting on a stage or shooting in the real world makes no difference in terms of the edit, really at all. This feels think. though. It's funny. I was talking. I think it's a Carly about this. Carly Williams. Like, you look at these shots and suddenly. You're like, I think you could buy it as real, but you feel like, oh, this is what it looks like in a movie when someone's in a car. Let's make a deal, like your okay. brain switches to that. Whereas when we shoot everything else, it's so clearly real. 
you know, like all the stuff of you guys in Waterloo, where this, though, you're like, hmm, this does look like a movie. It's you know? because it's because the camera is so static. Like, yeah. If, if I could have shot this for real in a car, in like a '90s, ugh, it was just way too many complications. Like, how do we get the back? Even if we, we we talked about putting the background really soft and shooting mm-hmm. in New York, but then it's like, yeah. how do you control it? It's just impossible. So, yeah. here's something where we didn't know if the blackberry was reading right that that's what he'd been eating and that's what the stain is but i think most people i thought you were gonna i thought you were gonna talk about the uh the prototype case being left oh and what just that that was a lot well that i remember i begged you you for it yeah well you were the one who came up with it because obviously he left the case but i thought it would be way more interesting for the audience to to not know no i know until mike said it and uh, so i think i asked you guys right before the shoot right to make sure you got the shot yeah yeah. yeah, you said make sure to get that shot, and I I yeah. did not understand it. No, no, no. I was like, mm-hmm. why would we want the audience to know sure beforehand? And boy, was you I got to show them the bomb, man. I know. I was, I, I was proved completely wrong. I have been my own worst enemy when it comes to more or less all filmmaking, and I've learned so many lessons from from this movie specifically that mm-hmm. that you want to hand your audience as many yeah. something that shows the keyboard, just like as many. Like questions, as many uh, uh, like big pieces of information mm-hmm. that you can, so that they can kind of play with them in their mouth a bit before yeah. before you then resolve them. Yeah. Great. This one was another biggie that went through lots of changes, and I think a ton is cut out. From I think I think is this not the first scene that was edited in the movie? No, it was the car scene. The, or no, you know what it actually was? Well, I mean, they did all those assembly edits, but uh, the, the first one I did was the Stanos Google scene. And then oh. the first one you and I did together when you came here was the car scene on the way that we yeah. just watched. But then this must have not been long after. This was close after. Yeah, we tried to just keep rolling when we did this I, one. I remember I see cutting like right, no, I, I, 50 I versions of this speech. So many, I know. Family. Staying connected or whatever. Like, but, and it's one of these scenes that, yeah, was kind of always open as far as we didn't feel like we cracked it for a long time. Oh, my but God. Man, what a good feeling when you think you have so five months later. Isn't other cell phone companies <sighs> home phone When you have five months to go, you mean? Those are three minutes. No, I'm saying, like, we probably recut this scene, you know, off and on How for the course of the whole edit. This was probably, this might have been the most re-edited scene. Yeah, yeah. Just because, because there is so much other stuff, right? Like there's more to this pitch. And even this, it's funny how much in our own heads we were about it where we're like, well, people get the stuff that Jim's saying and like where he got it from and when did he rehearse it. And it's so funny how that stuff just doesn't seem to matter too much. Well, no, no, no. Yeah, but, but you know what? Don't, don't, don't uh, uh, you can tell your market. sell yourself short because we wind up creating a context for this character whereby he can now deliver this speech and the audience will believe it. And that happened because of things that we changed in Act 1. Earlier, yeah. Like we changed a bunch of shit that happened beforehand that made Jim as a character seem more resolute and mm-hmm. and almost like – it seemed like he was connected to this world in a way that, that he just wasn't early on. And I think a lot right. of that – Even him probably like perking up when they pitched the idea to him, right? Like yeah, in the exactly. Office. That's something where we totally had him just kind of dismissing Mike and Doug in the first versions. Built for pages. Where now even – yeah, it's like he knows there's something there right off the bat. <laughs> Which is another great example of how two cameras will give you so many opportunities because you get a performer like Saul Rubinek who is – a genius like this guy does not get enough credit for what he's able to do every single take he is coming up with different behavior different things to do and what's so cool is that that behavior is somewhat random and in, by that i mean he's doing unique things at different points of the performance but if you're shooting him in a close-up against another performer you can cherry pick all of the best things and that's what what we were doing here with Saul. Here's a little moment that we changed 
from the movie to the series. That line, yeah. If you watch the if you watch the mini series that just got changed two days ago. Saul saying, "Uh, yeah." At the end, there we realized it's way better to not have him say anything and just give a reaction like, "Whoa, this guy knows what's up." Forever pulling on your servers, whether you got an email or not. We have a fix. Score is very beautiful here. Good job, Jay. Yeah, Jay really did incredible work. I know that he There's told. Yeah. That that, well, that that's what did it. It was like you finding that shot that goes from Saul up to, to Jim. Jim. And I was going to say, there we jumped the axis. And I was like, hmm, should we do it? But a shot like well, that. you do. Yeah, you do it at, at an important moment when something changes for the character. Yeah. Sends it. We engage with your network. Another, another thing I should talk about is the fact that more or less every single time our characters' mouths are not on screen, like every single time Jay turns his head, turns around, we put different words. It's in ADR. Mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we, we change his dialogue. Or not ADR, yeah, it's just different takes. Just yeah. different takes. Um, and uh, that that will allow you to make, make long, overwritten speeches way shorter. That's the other so great thing stuff. about how we shoot way more opportunities I think in our style to do that yes than if it was like well thought out well blocked shots where characters aren't constantly turning their backs to the camera it's, and whatnot. it's it's the the adage the programming adage actually of turning your bugs into features which mm-hmm. is you need to take the things that are bad about the way that you work or who you are or the situation you're in and turn those into the best thing about mm-hmm. how you work. And so this point Kurt just brings up about the fact that we shoot in kind of a jumbled mess. It's chaotic and we don't always know what we're doing. Yeah. Like I, I specifically don't always know exactly what the most interesting thing in the frame is, but that allows for new things to happen and for us to discover things in the edit that are probably mm-hmm. better than anybody could have thought of on set. And so you pay a cost up front. Obviously, we're paying an aesthetic cost. But we were willingly paying that cost in order to have access to all of these tools that other filmmakers cannot use, mm-hmm. right? And hopefully, and hopefully that does give a, a vibe, an energy to our stuff that people seem to respond well to when they like it. Some people, I think it alienates them and they don't want to watch. But I think you feel it. It's like the combination of seemingly hectic, you know, random stuff that actually is being presented, hopefully in a really well thought out way. And I think that combination is like intriguing and interesting and hopefully entertaining. You, well, it's almost like chaos with a with a thread through it. Yeah. And that thread is glowing. Mm-hmm. And so although it seems completely random, there seems to be an order that is is yeah. is is being assembled through it. And that that's that's the way life feels. In fact that's mm-hmm. the difference between living in the moment and a memory. Whereas in a memory, you, you kind of know, oh, that moment was about this or whatever. Mm. But when you lived it, you had no idea what it was about. Right. right. Mm-hmm. It now, I mean, I obviously haven't watched this since we were in Berlin, but uh, looking at... Uh, morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Just looking at Jim's or Glenn's behavior, these faces that he makes. <laughs> yeah. He really is never bad. Oh, no, I know. It's... It was such a treat for seeing, like, the dailies for the movie with him and Jay and you and everyone. Uh, I was pretty stoked. It's funny. I was bad most of the time, um, especially considering that I'm also calling action and cut, like, erratically from in, in, in character in a way yeah. that's quite, quite uh, um, well, makes it difficult to act. But... Uh, it would have been funny if, like, the guy playing Jim was directing the movie, screaming at people. And then, yeah. And then I'd be like, cut. Like, it makes sense. Your energy, you could kind of keep it at dug yeah. level while you're directing, you know? This was a scene we cut out for a while, I believe. No, it's still, just... it's, still, it's still cut out. It's still cut out. But it was even more cut out. It was more, I mean, yeah. like, Jim we, used to walk in on this celebration. On the celebration, right? yeah. Yeah. Because Jay's about to explain yeah, we, uh, it all. Jay Baruchel explains it all. I need to address the... Uh, oh, or did I talk about this in the other commentary? The, my, my Alisana shirt. Is, oh, yeah. You is, a big fan or no? No, I'm not, but I but Doug would have been. And um, 
It's tech. actually I think I talked about this in the other commentary, so I won't I won't bring it up again. No no need to well, that. that you thought it was a movie. Yeah. No, I knew it was a band. Oh. But but it's but it's a band that started in two thousand and four, which is when this timeline originally was when we oh, shot yeah. it. Like yeah. this was all supposed to be two thousand and four. And then I think for a legal reason, we had to change it to two thousand three. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think there was a script version that said two thousand for a while. Mm, and fuck yeah. No, it was two thousand one. Earlier, it was two thousand one because yeah. it was going to be nine eleven. Right. Yeah. yeah, we bounced around. But I then think we... there was something else. Oh, I was thinking of this the other day. What do you say? Oh, in the Baldur's Gate deleted scene, which will be in the series. Or no, Alan. Doesn't Alan say this is new Baldur's Gate? This is new Baldur's which, Gate. Which then I, when I was looking up trying to find like the menu music for it, I saw that Baldur's Gate came out like 2002 or something or earlier. So now that is a funny line because it's not so new. You know, that, that, but it is still the new Baldur's Gate. Because especially Baldur's back then. Gate, yeah, like, like yeah, for a game to be only a year old, it's still new. He's saying the new Baldur's Gate in reference to Baldur's Gate 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But still, I bet that was written when it was newer than that. Dude, in the original script, they had the uh, uh, the beta from Bioware directly. And there was a whole oh, scene cool. in the script where we talked about getting the original from Bioware. That's cool. Mm. I just said three words. Uh, okay. This, so this, this is another nice. I, I don't know how many people catch this or laugh at this. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, I'm sure you explained the truth on the other commentary or no? No, it didn't come up. I think we completely skipped over it. You Let's want go. to or no? Large that, no. No, okay. we better not. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we shouldn't talk about it. <laughs> I'm just talking about his um, laughing. How you this, came up with that? With uh, I think I did talk about how we got Carrie to laugh, and that's that in real life, Carrie is an unbelievably um, well, what would you say, gregarious? He's like the mm-hmm. ghost of Christmas presents in in real life. Like he is Mister Fun, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the character that he's playing is kind of like a bit of a shark. We, the idea was somebody who could like kind of out shark Jim. But when we did the first take of it, I was like, ah, oh, this is kind of like dead energy. Mm-hmm. And so I, I said to Carrie, hey, let's try doing this like like with your natural joy and then we'll we'll see what happens. And so he did one take where he's, where he's going off yeah. in the way that he does in real life. And then Kurt just cut it against – Okay. Against one of the more serious takes after, right, basically from this point here. Mm-hmm. You guys love <laughs> so, Yeah, you guys love saying sorry. And it's like, oh, wow, this guy's tone changed quite quickly. Scary man. Yeah, it became quite scary. Yeah. You know who's afraid of sharks? Carl Yankowski. Sh- sharks. <laughs> <laughs> this, this guy, this shark. This shark is afraid of sharks. <laughs> That gives us a market cap about. Man, this is another scene that we edited for. So what would happen? Well, the the I don't know. The scripted shot version is about at least twice as long. Longer, longer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. That's a Bobby. Shout out to Bobby. Can't which, say too much about it. Which, which the fork, it, which, the fork and the pause, and then cutting to Carl in the back. I love that well, little moment. Well, that's a very Bobby move. Bobby loves like those moments where a man is. Like uh, uh, containing all his rage. That's that's Bobby to a T. Eh? He loves these moments. He's like, and he just wants to kill him, you know. But instead, he just shaves his head. Oh, that's what Bobby did. Yeah, yeah. That's what Bobby did when he wanted to kill me. Right. Okay. Bobby should have went with the gym when he shaved his head. That would have been funny. <laughs> Our friend Bobby shaved his head during the edit, but he shaved it evenly. It was such a mistake. Yeah, he should have full. He should have gone full, full gym. gym. Here's another one. We took out the hockey stuff, I think, at one point. Or we wouldn't show the TV. Um, it's funny when you watch the finished movie and there's all these versions that we had for so long. And sometimes I still get surprised with like, oh, right. That's the final version. Well, it's like remembering a dream. Mm-hmm. It, like it just doesn't feel right until uh, until you just kind of have it. Mm-hmm. I wonder. It seems as though the thing that really uh, – Okay. There's well, something we don't usually do. You know what it was? Were you watching? Um, we start up. the shot on you, and then the lights turn on, and then you stand up when the camera pans over to the door. 
they're coming in, and then we cut back to you with that same coverage at the beginning of that shot. Yeah, so you that's can tell great. that you're cutting from camera to camera. Yeah. No, that we're or from same camera to yeah, same camera. Yeah, in the same camera. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's okay. Oh, this is this is a fun little um, goof coming up. Turn that fucking thing off. So the, that, right, yeah, you go ahead. You can explain it. Yeah. That, that turn that fucking thing off is just from the beginning of a different take. It was only ever supposed to be okay. him saying that to start the scene, and then they successfully turn the projector off. But we thought, wouldn't it be funny if the whole time it's just – at risk of blaring him. him in the eyes until, yeah. And I think you – that was a real creation from you. But mm-hmm. I, I loved it so much that then I started realizing, oh, we can have a lot of these actors repeat their dialogue just by mm-hmm. taking two takes and looping them. And mm-hmm. then I started doing that with, uh, with Jay. And I mm-hmm. – uh, specifically in his pitch scenes, I would take his, his lines – his line so I created this. I created – yeah, what is he? I created this entire fucking market. Yeah. And each yeah. of those – like he repeats himself in the scene, but in real life he right. didn't. Which is fun and such a cool little tool to use in a movie to make something feel real. Because it's very often you're not having characters repeat a line unless – it really makes sense, you know? But, yeah, and it sort um, of shows that he's starting to get detached from reality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like we wouldn't have written this. This character is just going nuts. See this? I wouldn't know. Yeah, we're going to cut right away, right? Yep. Where for a long time we held on it forever, showed everyone's reaction in the room. Something we really learned from those test screenings, too, is like you think you can trust an audience a lot more than you think sometimes, and they're really yes. usually picking up – a lot and what you're showing them and every second really is counting and so as soon as you're like lingering for too long and you've already made your point and you're like look at all the characters in the room being uh feeling dejected and sad yeah Yeah, it's like uh we get it you can move on you really want to keep the ball in the hands of your protagonist all the time so whatever whatever you're doing have the audience follow the ball Mm-hmm. And if the ball is leaving the room with Mike and Doug to go talk in the hallway, do not stay in the room where the ball is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't stay in the room without the ball. Follow yeah. the ball. Yeah, exactly. So you're also giving your audience an opportunity to, like, check in with themselves. Of, like, and realize this is kind yeah, of boring. Wait, yeah. what's going on? Yeah. yeah. Am I liking this? <laughs> well, this is, yes. a f- this is a fun one. Like, the reveal of Doug. Like a fun moment, or I don't like know how if, we cut it. Yeah, yeah, because originally we like you saw me walk up to those windows. Yeah, yeah. there's some ADR, which I think is good. There's no ADR. I don't think that really stands out as super nasty that I've heard. Yes, yes. and like I cringe when I hear it. You know, I, so far, but that's because I hate ADR. I spent so long yeah. recording and re-recording this shit. Yeah. But that's a good one. That's some tricks I don't even know if we can fully explain. But like the way this would take this kind long. of the next yeah, – I'll just say it as quick as I can. This the whole sequence playing it with like the salesman and Jim doing his thing and all this stuff and like selling more phones or not was written and shot quite different. I'd say this is probably the most like restructure that happened in the whole edit was – By far. Yeah. I would say this was a total, total, almost inversion of what was, <laughs> right. was shot. Yeah. But we realized in, in earlier versions, it wasn't totally clear that, like, Mike did think that Jim was not going to be selling more phones. That, you know, Mike's version of their last conversation is he won't be selling more phones, where Jim is, you know, no, I think if you asked him. You're actually saying it wrong. You're saying what the, what the movie's doing. What the way it was written is that Mike, in that moment, agreed. Yeah, that's tacit, what I mean. Yeah. Ta- yeah. yeah, tacitly to let Jim sell phones. Right. Well, he just, yeah, he doesn't bet. <laughs> He kind of backs down from Jim being like, I'm doing this. Yeah, and he's he like, gets mm, bullied. Okay. Yeah, and then so later when Jim sold phones and he's like, what the hell do you think I'm doing, Mike? Like Jim is totally right the way we shot it and wrote it initially. He did tell Mike he was going to go sell more phones. So anyways, we had to throw in these little ADR lines to at least make it more believable where everyone's perspective was. Yeah, we tried to make it seem like there was a, a miscommunication between Mike mm-hmm. and Jim where Jim – basically said i'm going to do what i want and mike said okay he's not going to sell phones because yeah, I, can, I can trust him yeah and then because we had so many inserts of blackberries and we had so many shots of characters facing away from the camera we could reconstruct the story so that now jim is going behind mike's back and selling mm-hmm. phones which is what leads to all the big complications of the second act mm-hmm I need to take a second here to just talk about Rich Summer. I'm sure I said this in the other commentary. This guy is crouched over like an unbelievable performer. 
And you could write anything on a piece of paper and say, hey, your character says this. Come work for me. And he would mm -hmm. deliver it in a way that you would have assumed he just came up with it off the top of his head. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's great. How much break it? Excuse me? How much? You can look, look at, you can see both these guys just thinking. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. See, I love this. I love waiting to show the wide until this moment to reveal. Oh, there's other people listening. I'll give you a million dollars if you sign right now. I like that. I like that. <laughs> no, tell me, because you cut this. Like, yeah. was Glenn watching him unplug the computer there, or was he looking at something else? When he smiled, I think it was a bit delayed from when it happens in the edit, but that is like a reaction to the idea of that happening. Oh, it's sincere. That's great. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Well, you don't have to. This is another thing that's so great about this, this style is that sometimes Jared, who's clearly operating this camera on Summer, will be like, ah, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to I'm going over here. I'm going to go over to Glenn. <laughs> like, I know I'm supposed to be shooting Rich Summer's close up, but, mm -hmm. but fuck it. I'm going to go roam to the other which, side. Which is always nice to get those little treats, those little pieces of a shot that is doing more than you expect. It's nice to have those to work as like, you know, the base of a scene. Be like, well, yes. I think this... We'll make it. So let's start here and work our way And then you cut out. around it. That's yeah. another thing is that very rarely, if ever, correct me if I'm wrong, we almost never start cutting scenes from, from the first shot. We'll normally watch No, footage. yeah, we'll watch something that really can be like the, yeah, we'll, yeah we'll just the look starting at, point. We'll look at takes until we see a piece of performance where we're like, okay, well, we that can't has live. To be in it. Yeah, we can't live without this look. Yeah. And then we'll edit the whole scene around that look. Yeah. So... So regardless of what the scene was supposed to be about. Yeah, you, you use the special moment, whatever yeah, you got on set. The, yeah. the special moment. Kurt said it uh, to me, which is that he looks for what we didn't intend to happen or the mistake, <laughs> the mistake of the, of the shoot, and then try to force the mistake to make sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's when you feel that little trick happening. Uh, yeah. Where you think, like, how, how did they plan that? And then the answer is usually we didn't. We didn't and plan it. So it feels good. Yeah. How you doing? Welcome. Where are you coming from? And this is actually supposed to be a scene, right? A gigantic scene. A pretty long scene. one, yeah. yeah. But this is another battle we were playing with this whole sequence, which is like, if this dude shows up, you got to think maybe Mike is telling him about the problem they're having and it's not going to be such a surprise later when it's like, okay, team meeting, here's what we're dealing with. Who knows how to solve it? So we tried to strategically you know, show as little as possible to not get you thinking about more than you should be during all this and, and where Mike and Doug are at and, and the team and solving the problem they're facing, which hopefully you're just thinking they don't realize it's as big of a problem as it is. This sequence, Kurt in many ways wrote before we shot it, the scene of, the, of those three brothers going around and selling phones. And it was the last thing we shot in the fall we went back and we're like, okay, what can we have these three salesmen do that actually shows Jim's psychological approach to sales, etc. And all we had was the stuff in that little uh, sales office room. And then we went out and basically shot stuff and we're just delivering it to Kurt that day for him to cut together to try to make a story out of it. This thing with the, with the, the tailor all of this stuff, these are these little tiny vignettes that we we came up with because Kurt was like, I need something that I can show a little story happening with these guys. And then, of course, from there, got the uh, VO from Jim instructing them on what to do, which was really written, like, at the very end of it all, where we still thought the scene was missing something, and then, yeah. Yeah, and that happened very quick. I, like, wrote wrote a speech for Glenn to say, and I emailed it to him. And yeah. then he, he sent me the audio back like in an hour. And what's the line? Um, who is this prick and how do I be more like him? Who is this? Yeah, who is this prick and how can I be more like him? Yeah. Yeah, which is funny because without that, you that shot really might be kind of annoying. Like you're watching this guy laughing. Uh, laugh, but instead it's like, yeah, taking these things and spinning them a bit in your favor. Maybe. Mm. 10, it's that great line about voiceover, which is that it can okay. never be telling you what you're seeing. Okay. It can only be modifying what you're mm -hmm. seeing to create an ironic Hello. interpretation. Yeah. What the fuck is happening? Will you accept this whole thing? Are you still 
still there. What are you saying? This whole thing? This whole thing? What? I think there was one. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I picked that whole take just because I liked his hi at the end. <laughs> like, that's what that shot. <laughs> so, I'm sure there's other things that are good about it, but that was really where I saw him say hi, and I thought that was funny. You know, like, yeah, hi. Was the take. <laughs> yeah. Well, Baruchel's so amazing at, like, <laughs> well, this is what we love. The, the, the seemingly random uh, uh, cadence of certain mm-hmm. words where certain words will be pronounced yeah. totally out of step with the rest of the sentence. Yeah. And again, editing will let you focus on those in a way that is just, okay. that makes them sound uh, incredible. Yeah, the entire system yeah. is crashing. He's selling more phones. <laughs> Damn it! Yeah, yeah. I like that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was another one. Yeah, it was just that. Yeah, hold off. Selling more phones. I'm not... <laughs> Yeah, and lots of ADR <laughs> snuck in that little exchange too. Let's yeah, not stuff. Yeah, this, this is you dorks. Yeah. Which, which, by the way, I realized we shouldn't have put in. How come? We don't need the line of "Do I need somebody to come babysit you guys?" Because he does go get somebody to babysit them in the next scene. He did not need to say it. No, I know. Well, he should have said a different version of it. It's like you guys are fucking around. He shouldn't have. He shouldn't have given the solution. He should have like presented the problem. Presented which the maybe problem. He already is. Yeah, he kind of but, is. Yeah, I think it was bad writing. It was bad writing. Yeah. The union isn't ripping my guts out. I need a big scary guy. I need a big scary guy in the next scene, around. and he needs to come and be even scarier than me. Still bald, but older, <laughs> bigger. Yeah, here's another kind of like double button I would say that exists on this scene, but. I'll allow it. In Waterloo. It used to have a triple button. I kept making jokes that they keep going back and forth with like zingers at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I sign? <laughs> it was very Rick and Morty. Yeah. So, um, in the meantime, we're having a bit of a network issue. Look at Michael Scott. Look at how he's looking right now. He's amazing. Like this guy. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah. If he's on camera, he's good. You two, you're with Mike. The rest of you, I don't know what. I was going to say, I also wondered, like, if it was good that we only showed two dudes and here the two dudes with their hand up or if we should have kind of, I don't know, like showed more people being recruited in a recognizable way. Like, here's this guy, here's that guy. But Are you saying what would have been better? Obviously, that would have been better. What yeah, are you talking yeah. about? Of course. Yeah, but at the same time, if you, like, it would be weird to be like, look at this character. They're going to be important, and then they... Oh, and then they never have any dialogue? Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe. Oh, I love that rack that just yeah, happens. It's on Purdy, and then someone crosses in the foreground, and then phew, the rack happened on the cross. Yeah, I remember that was one of the last things on you someone. did. Yeah. That was one of the last things you did. Yeah. I'm sure you talked about this in the other commentary. I've talked about this in, like... Uh, yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. Don't, in, say, like, it. don't so say it. Don't yeah. say it. Don't say it. I also think that this is funny, cutting him off when he says, you're the chief. But I don't know if it's gotten a single laugh from anyone besides me. You know, the, you, the the hard lesson that I think we were both learning, and Bobby too, is that half the shit that we thought was funny, nobody thinks is funny. And all the stuff that we thought was like, ah, this isn't funny yeah. at all is getting huge laughs. Yeah, and that, yeah. There's nothing more painful. Like, dude, to me, some of the funny shit in the movie is when Mike is saying it's a keyboard on a screen on a keyboard. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard anybody laugh at that. Oh, we got to talk about this. I love that this. shot too. You got to come. It's like talk, <laughs> That's another one of those, obviously not, it was not shot for the movie. That was the tail end of whatever the shot was supposed to be in that moment. He's talking about me giving a piggyback ride to Michael Scott because yeah. I like him so much. <laughs> that's, that's the real life explanation you mean? That is why I was giving him. Yeah, 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 yeah. But also in the movie, resonant. Yeah, yeah. It's called resonance. <laughs> this is another moment of us being like, oh, you know what? What they're saying makes a lot more sense and is accurate more than the stuff, the ramblings that happened in Rim One that we chopped up. But uh, here's another example where cutting the dialogue before they're finished makes it feel like there's more going on than what we're really seeing. This this was. We could divide the signal three ways. A case in point that if you had seen this scene with them actually delivering all of their dialogue <laughs> clearly, they all seemed just. It was just so boring. It was so boring. Yeah. But yes. by cutting it, by cutting, by making it elliptical, yeah. it wound up seeming one way more competent. Like the uh, the engineering of it seemed more competent, and two, it was a lot more punchy to follow. A yeah. lot more. And it's fun to feel like, oh, I'm getting little pieces and I'm kind of getting it. But of course, I couldn't fully understand. But because then when I'm you not show an engineer. Full, yeah, but when you yeah. show the full scene, you're like, wait, that's it? 
that sounds like I understand all of that. I shouldn't probably understand all that. Yeah, exactly. Also, that line while he's running out, one of my faves. Right. You can, can have, have my bacon. bacon. <laughs> They're paying me $10 million. Yeah, <laughs> Co-CEO. Look at Jay's got the moves here, right? I love this. <laughs> I wonder what an audience is thinking in that moment. Like, what's going to play out? Mike's going to run in. They're going to go, let's do it. Like, that is fun to think of. You got to, well, look, that's the intention. Can. Yeah, no, I know, but I'm just saying I could never appreciate that moment as someone who knew what was going to happen. I know. Something um, they never tell you when you become a filmmaker <laughs> is that you will never enjoy anything you make yeah. ever. Here's one where yes, come in. another valuable thing from the test screening. There's a whole scene that plays out between these two yeah. where they're just saying what's about to happen in the next scene. And, and yeah, during that test screening, it became so obvious. Like right after we Mike just it. in that scene said, yeah. uh, ah, Mr. Purdy, sorry about what happened before. They have a two-minute scene where Mike <laughs> asks him to go in and Can yell at these there? guys. Yeah. Can you go in there and say this and say this and say this? And in a script, you just don't realize how horrible that is. Yeah. But I'll say, as, as the guy who had to direct that scene, it felt aimless, and I was having trouble right. explaining mm to the actors what like the gist of it was. And that is a sign uh -huh. that what you have written is not working. Mm. And I knew oh, then goodness. when we, Sorry. like the scenes that feel bad as you're shooting them, there is <laughs> no. something wrong with them. You know, something's yeah, wrong with them. And uh, I just didn't have the wisdom uh, uh, to, uh, to pull the plug. Also, right. I mean, like what I've got like a hundred people around me. Well, I can't very well say, you know what? We don't actually mm -hmm. need this scene. It never, never have happened. You think this is also, I'm sure is that they're pros and they could have nailed it, but maybe there's something good about sending them in to have this conversation, you know, and they're gearing up for it mm. and you're cutting it early and it's still, you know, they're not just going in to say one line. And yeah. Oh, wow. I, mm -hmm. I'd not even thought of that. Yeah, I mean, again, I, w I still would have probably done it the exact same way if I had to do it again. Mm -hmm. But little boys playing with their little penises. This is another great editing decision. It seems like a shooting decision, and of course it is. I mean, Jared is brilliant in going in on this look, but now, are there you, the timing of that. We played with it a few times. Yeah. That's one, something that changed from Berlin to the final cut. We're stuck. Yeah, the timing of that girl's look. <laughs> Take it where I want to. Pump it up, party. This is a pretty funny little moment, I think. <laughs> I love that Doug is boys with the car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How's it going, bro? Yeah. <laughs> Doug's saying movie night tonight. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm sad we didn't actually show any of Ninja Turtles in the movie. Me too. I should have been the movie at the end, man. I fought for it. For some reason, Miller was like, can't happen. Yeah, legal. And by that point, I was like, done with my legal fight. up. <laughs> I mean, I hadn't given up, but I was like, there's <laughs> nothing. I'd, I'd won enough battles, I didn't need to fight anymore. Yeah. What the hell happened to my friends? Uh, yeah. Please tell me the plunger's still on the computer. But yeah, at the very least, let the plunger be on the... <laughs> what?! Wait, now that's it. <laughs> Would you do that with the plunger? Right in the little trash can. I don't know. You think Just they would have taken the it to the, to the bathroom? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> put that plunger in the toilet, man. That should have been the scene. You go in the washroom and it's sitting there you got this. in its rightful place. So the scene is me. I watch all my friends discarding their old culture. And then I decide I need to use the bathroom. Quick bathroom break. I'm a quick bathroom break Mike. before I go confront Mike. <laughs> Wait, oh, wait a minute. My plunger's right next to the toilet? Ew! <laughs> Ew! Nice Here's, job. I think this is a good scene. This oh, me too. Job. Me too. Heavily edited, though. But again, one of the great gifts, this is another secret backdoor trick you get when you shoot movies the way we do, is that when you yeah. do decide to stay in a shot for you know 40 seconds it gives yeah. the feeling of whoa this is it, you, important yeah. the audience really notices and so here we get to see doug really have a nice thought for the first yeah. time in the movie and you go oh this is different mm -hmm. 
never see their families. But always being able to cut out because, like, I really have no idea what I'm doing. Because they get to work and my performance was okay for the beginning, but then I said something stupid because I'm kind of just handballing it. And so then we cut to Mike so that I can change my dialogue before I come back. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then this is a different take of me saying, yeah, that must be it. Should you have kept the bandana off in part three? <laughs> Do you think? I don't think, yeah, I didn't put that bandana back on for a few hours. <laughs> no, you should have left it off the, whole, the rest of the movie. I, mean, I probably should have, to be totally yeah. honest. It was, a, it was a, another, it was an error. I should. Although, you know what? You don't fully give up yet. You're still hanging around. Yeah, that's right, actually. This board feels that in order to avoid... I love his little smack he's going to give. It's best we end our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> We're just getting started. <laughs> Every time I see the shot that's coming soon of the newspaper, I'm like, shit, is that too fast? Think of that when, when it cuts to it. Yeah, okay, I'll look like, at it. long enough to read it. No. Look, Saul... It's over. Look, no. it's, it's, isn't like... <laughs> If there's a better advertising uh, advertisement for Saul Rubinek as a, like, bring him in to save your movie actor, I don't know what it could be. Look at him. Yeah, every he's scene so he's in, every shot, he's, like, dead on perfect mm. bullshit. <laughs> Try me. Okay. Rimstock. Rimstock. Rock. Rock. Whoa. But that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It just... When I'm watching it in the theater, I go, ah. Bow. Bow. This, this idea here that you're about to see where the camera cuts to all the engineers and we see them in a moment of stress, this was not planned. This is just random footage that, that I found of the engineers from part three in the movie, and we cut it all together. Yeah, really, it's only supposed to be Doug, right? It's that only really supposed to be Doug, yeah. Bow. Bow. Here's this music cue that was in the very first edit of this sequence that made it to the end. I really love I this love part that. of the song. At, I was like, oh, that's so look. great for Mike. Yeah. And yeah. Go back into it. And several versions of the movie had a ton of archive come in at this moment. We are number one in handsets. Here. Showing Blackberry in uh, like TV shows and just taking over the world. But at this point, you know what? Shout out Dusty and Madeline because I think their feedback helped me at least when they're like, at that point, at this point in the movie, like we don't want to see this, you know, archive stuff anymore. But we've also gotten feedback that maybe it could have been good to, to big up Rim a bit more if we could have and showed how, how huge they they've gotten at this point. Yeah, which which is something that we did in the miniseries. Like, yeah, Kurt, Kurt went in and basically made a whole section of how big Research in Motion. Yeah. And the Blackberry had become by this point. Yeah. I guess maybe too, though, we're kind of banking on that the average person's knowledge. Like a movie exists about this thing for a reason. You know what I mean? It's like now you're jumping to the end when they were huge. Uh, that's a good but. spot to leave it for today, guys. Thank you. Um, uh, hey, where's Jim? We're also depending on that wig to be <laughs> you're doing a lot of the storytelling for us. Yeah, that's right. This shot you didn't love, and I always thought it looked good. I, I thought hate it looked it. like TV. I, I hate this shot. Nice. Yeah, I thought it looked good. I, I hate it. I got a friend that went and saw the movie in theater a couple hours ago, and now they just texted me four messages. Oh, Should I read them on air? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Is it a filmmaker? Yeah. Okay. Ready? Yeah. No, and that's too lame. It's like self-congratulatory because it's very nice of them. It's okay, then, sweet. yeah, forget it. We just yeah, we let, yeah. read the burns. Read the burns. This right. actor's name is Eric Osborne, and he is, uh, again, like, I mean, you, I'm sure by this point you've realized that just about every one of these uh, uh, side characters in Blackberry, it's not Mike, Jim, or Doug, we went to the ends of the earth to try to find the absolute best people to play each of these roles because we knew that Glenn and Jay were going to be giving such major performances that it would make any substandard acting stand out like a sore thumb. So we auditioned and searched for every single other role in this movie forever. And, uh, and in my opinion, they're all, they're all incredible. Eric Osborne is, I mean, that's what he's like in real life.
an iPod. Oh, I edited him before. Because yeah, he's in Random Acts in, of Violence, right? Yeah, in Jay's movie. Yeah. An iPod. He gets stabbed a lot. A oh, that's, that's such a brutal scene. Yeah. Are you getting Cut it? to it. How does it work? With the audio commentary? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we throw up Random Acts? Big surprise, yeah, in hour 13 to the... Or 20. I'm just noticing, what is that little rainbow thing in the bottom right-hand corner of the frame? Yeah, that's... I'm not sure. It's green or something. It's a rainbow on a screen on a phone. That's gone. I was going to say, yeah. Are you getting it? Blackberry, Palm Trail, Nokia E62, the usual suspects. The usual suspects? It seems like such a painful thing <laughs> for it. Steve Jobs to oh, say. Oh, yeah, it is rude. Isn't it fun, too, being of an age where now... Why would anybody want we jump to this part of the past, and it's like, hmm, this doesn't feel like that long ago. Like this presentation, I, I certainly remember. When it yeah, I, I, you're I, a lot I, older than me, so I imagine. You, I, I think I was born. How at old the, are you? Well, I was born at the uh, beginning of the year. You were born at the end of the year. Um, so yes, of our years. No, I was, it's of that year. Yeah, that I was. I'm just born. thinking about and the years of now. Few, well, I'm just to, to change the subject. Yeah, yeah. Um, this moment that we just saw of all the different faces reacting to mm -hmm. Steve Jobs' news, that was a real Bobbyism. I remember. Yeah, that was a good Bobby up church, yeah. Showing sure. all the reaction shots, yeah. And the right, iPhone. Boom. Yeah. We're calling it iPhone, and then the score that was all Bobby up church. We love you, Bobby. Oh, oh um, we, let's, talk, let's talk about that. How you guys are, how we don't believe just in editing picture, we also edit score. And that's something oh, we yeah, think more yeah, filmmakers yeah, yeah. should be doing. If this is I, not, I'm sure they are. You don't think that they are? According to some people, they well, we are. the way we approach music and scoring, so, maybe. Well, you, you, you tell us, folks. Um, it, it, what we do is we'll have Jay basically compose like huge swaths of music that he, that are not necessarily specific to certain scenes there's just about tone or the energy of, of of a moment or the energy of the movie and then kurt will listen to that stuff and then he will decide where he wants to put a lot of stuff and so it's almost like he's creating new feelings by taking score that maybe jay thought should play over we'll say this scene right now of doug talking on the phone with the sec maybe jay wrote a theme for this and maybe kurt hears that and is like ah we can actually play this without score let's take this cue and put it somewhere else or let's take two cues and cut them together or let's take a cue and slow it down 30 percent which is mm -hmm. something that bobby, bobby used to do a lot and it it's it, it basically if you could if you could take one thing from this it's that the philosophy of rigidity around people's roles around the script around your job as a filmmaker yes you should really let go of that and relinquish the the tightness that you hold everything because if your composer is willing to let his music be used wherever and your editor is like, well, I, I don't care about what the script said. I'm going to do what I want. You can actually get at some much more interesting things. Than yeah, because as the writer and director, you're always going to know what your own ideas were and you can always go back to them, right? Yes. So you want to let all the other ideas in too and you can be like, that one's bad, that one's bad, but I'll keep that one that you would not have gotten had you not – welcomed okay. the yep. different ideas i was gonna to say too um about yes, jay's music Let's go. oh i think i'm sure people do that although i imagine a lot of times too you're just cutting with temp score go. stolen from other movies you know um this is good enough. and you're basically doing that with it but it is way way better when your composer can be the one giving you that temp score and then sometimes you can just be like, actually, now this is the real score, and we're keeping it right here as is. That's like, a great way. So, that's a great way of putting it. It's yeah. almost like if you can convince your composer to just give you like scratch versions of mm -hmm. songs that he's just thinking about, and, and then, then start the tempitis you get. Yeah, you, you can just keep it. Yeah, it's you beautiful. keep it, and then you get away from tempitis, which we hate. In fact, I don't think we've ever used that term. <laughs> I don't think we've ever used that term. We use it all the time. That, but. I don't think we ever use score from other things when we're making our stuff, do we? No. Or if we do, we 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 license it. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 this point that you made about like a director's job, in a way, I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I think that there is a pressure on filmmakers. 
to be a kind of leader who's like, I've got the best idea. And to say, I have the idea, and this is what we're all going to do. We're going to do my idea. Mm-hmm. And that the world's first is... If and look, if you really do have amazing ideas all the time, then then great and follow your instincts. But I I think in some ways that's a road to perdition because your job is not to have the best idea; it's to recognize the best idea, and that is a much more powerful tool because really every thought is thought twice in filmmaking. There's the origination of the thought. That thought could be you know a line of dialogue, or in this case, having Doug looking back and forth between Mike. And and Saul Rubinek, like that's a thought, but then it also needs to pass through the mind of the creator. And in that case, in this case, that's you, right? That's the filmmaker. And so the thought needs to occur not just as an individual idea. Oh, let's have the characters look at one another, and let's have Doug say no dialogue. What a cool thought! That then needs to pass through the filter of the director, and they need to be like, yes, okay, we'll have Doug say nothing, and here's how we'll do it. So you don't need to be so. Slogan, touchy right? about who came up with what so, like mm-hmm. the, like the, the, just drop all that and recognize that in the end it's going to be you who's deciding everything ultimately mm-hmm. and and that doesn't mean that you need to have originated at all because th- then your movie's going to suck your movie's going to suck no one person is smarter than 10 smart people okay mm-hmm. yeah. and yeah like you said you're still the one who yeah, yeah. Entire let the idea in and like said, yep, there it is. So that's still your authorship of the whole thing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it's such a, such a tangled mess. You And if you want to have like a team that wants to work with you, you want to have their represented on screen because that's how you create fraternity and longevity. Mm-hmm. Like, the, uh, uh, yeah, otherwise you're just a despot or, or mm-hmm. you're, you're pretending that you're some kind of genius mm-hmm. who is beyond anyone's help in a way. Mm-hmm. I'm giving you gold and I think you're But mind you, with that said, I've given this exact speech to my friends. I created this entire project. I'm giving you gold. I think you're all missing it. I created yeah. this entire About fucking movie. movie. I yeah. created this. I created this movie. This me. I, I created this. I, I created this entire Listen product class. Listen to me. The, crap, <laughs> the mouse pad. This is you pitching using slint to me. Built into the phone. We, Kurt, you got to talk about your talent and love for showing close-ups of extras. And <laughs> because this movie, more than probably, maybe Nirvana the band does it more. Yeah. But, well, you know what? I can only do it because I, I'm given the footage, which, yeah, Jared and you and everyone on set is really great at getting those moments without the extras usually knowing that they're on camera. And that is often the key. That's yeah, that's key. just where you feel the realness of them <laughs> just being real sitting there. But as soon as you're like, okay, you're you're on camera, here's your close-up, then yeah, you're probably not going to get the usable stuff. But so many of these reactions are just people that don't realize they're on camera. And again, this roaming documentary style camera allows you to do that because right. you don't need you don't need to shout, yeah. Okay, rolling, okay. Yeah, and like, harder to like trick someone to not know they're on camera when whereas yeah, this way Jared right can, in their face. Jared can just tilt the camera two degrees and yeah. the extras don't know, okay, they're shooting a close up of me and, and my head is now the entire frame. Yeah. And so it allows you to get these moments. And what I what it makes me feel like, and this is why I love it, it makes it feel like these c- people are watching the movie, you know, they're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. whoa, Jesus yeah. Christ. I mean, yeah. no greater example than when Jim shouts, I'm from Waterloo where the vampires hang out and people are looking at him like, what am I in the middle of? Yeah. Which this is a hell of a some, fucking movie. Some realness to that. In that moment, oh yeah, they probably are thinking some shit. version of that. Well, they're probably trying to figure out what the fuck does that mean. <laughs> Keyboard. Uh, this is my favorite. Scene. I'm sure you guys gave it. Well, when we that did, moment comes, we'll talk about it. About what that line is from. We, I don't think we did. Okay, we'll be ready. We, we will be. Th- this we, we should start we setting up now and keep talking about it until we get to it. <laughs> <laughs> giving it as much context. What were you gonna say? That scene that we just watched, the Verizon pitch, where Mike pitches a Blackberry Storm, is my favorite scene in the movie. Remember when I brought it to you guys in Toronto? I was here by myself, kind of for the first time for a while in, in the edit. I had a couple of weeks, and uh, 
that's a scene I cut, and I just was digging into part three for the first time. And then I brought it to you guys in Toronto to show I, I, And I watched it and I cried. I remember. I showed you and Bobby, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I watched it and I cried. And I was like, I well, can't was all those – tons of stuff changed from that first version, but the real big thing was the Doug play with Wood, Woodman. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I thought it was one of the funniest things I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> That's not a box. No, no, no. Okay, so it's a screen, but it needs a raised hand. On the Actually, background, on the so Jay, Jared Rab, obviously is like way more than just the cinematographer of this film. He's, well, for an example, he went in with Adam Belanger, and what you're watching on that whiteboard behind them is that, the that actual patent phototype, uh, um, prototype that, drawings uh, for wow. the Blackberry Storm, for real. Because I, I said That's always a good feeling for me. I always just trust that somebody well, like Jared or whoever well, Belanger has and, made sure. And Belanger, yeah. Yeah, they, they're very strict about that. That's all legit. Silent mode. When yeah, that's the – yeah. If, if you were to, if you were to oh, freeze frame that, sorry. you could build your own sorry, Blackberry sorry, Storm from those, uh, yeah. from those drawings. Okay, so you know what? I think all, all this is is we're trying to do the old Blackberry click while embracing – does this iPhone. one of these shots, unless it already happened, oh, no, no, we're not. go into the reaction shot of the guy in the background? Let's see. I think it's it, coming. It, it's coming right here. Yeah. And there's another we, shot where it's like, this is the reason why we use it, the take, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a keyboard on a screen. Yeah, see, I find that so funny. It's a keyboard on a screen on a screen keyboard. On a keyboard, yeah. And you. I don't care what, I don't care what you think of it. <laughs> From you and Bobby the first time. It's so too bad because, yeah. To me, that's like one of the funniest lines in the whole movie. <laughs> Doug, your boy, your boy's gone loco. <laughs> <laughs> that was dialogue, right? We cut that out. Who, who says it to you? Yeah, per- Pernay. Pernay comes up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, Doug, what's up with your boy? <laughs> it's a prototype, Charles. I can build the fucking thing myself. I love that little stumble. In a week, in a night, if I have to. Yeah. yeah. I said use the Onyx. I did. This one isn't also a scene that got cut early when I was still on the other show I was on at the time because y'all were just wanting to make sure it was playing correctly. Yeah. So we did edit, but then there was a pickup shot. I remember. So Maybe of your angle or someone's angle. No, it was um, on Jay. It was British right, yeah, at the yeah. end. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, but another one where pretty close to the first edit actually was like what we ended up going with, which is so funny. Some scenes you get it right China. in one of the earlier versions and then some, yeah, Wait, take months. Hey, hey, well, it makes a big difference when it's like – what am I doing? I'm trying to keep our... It seems like this is easier. This is yeah. kind of only one way it can go, yeah. Mike, I'm trying to help you. You're not, though. You're not. You're not helping me. This doesn't help me. If you could help me, we wouldn't be here. I don't need your fucking help anymore. Okay? You're fucking... So here's something. Place. Does Mike look up at the end of this? No. We keep him looking down. Yeah, he'll give a little look. He looks up. Yeah. yeah. yeah so he here's looks another up. thing I wouldn't have known for sure. No, it's important. Those are does. the funny little things. Yeah, I know, but those are the little things it's like you try out and do different versions of keep them looking down, make them look up. <laughs> Here's some ADR too coming at the end of the scene that really helped because at the top of the next scene, I think we would show people and they didn't quite know what was going on. I'm like just coming in here fiddling through stuff. And so the ADR line was, and I'll build the fucking thing myself. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a completely different, uh, scene and in fact this did not happen after he fired doug this actually happened like days later Mm. in the original script yeah i think we're we're achieving what i hoped when i cut some early versions of this which was really the the genius is not such a genius anymore he's a clunky mess um but that scene was or that sequence was a lot longer before with lots of like dropping shit and swearing and and smashing shit yeah gives the idea not really not right now what is what is this do we say that every wig shot in this in act three is a vfx shot uh no i don't even think we talked about it in uh in the other commentary that well, that's that, true. That Tristan Zarafa, who's our VFX supervisor and has been since the dirties, actually 
had tons to do on this movie. You wouldn't think it's a VFX film, but how many mm-hmm. shot? How many VFX shots are in the movie? Oh man, I don't know, hundred, a hundred, yeah, hundreds, hundreds, maybe, but it's maybe all, hundreds. It's tons of stuff that you wouldn't notice. Hopefully, but like, like cleanups, lo- yeah. lots of wig cleanups on Jay. Um, lo- like, like that's a VFX shot. What you're looking at right now, mm-hmm. we changed the photograph of Carl Yankowski. We we uh, take the Darren Aronofsky school of VFX, which is I know how much he loves. Just throw them in when uh, you don't need them, just to clean things up because you can. There's some shots of buildings with signs on them that the signs aren't there anymore, but the outline of where they were are. We talked about that. Oh, you did? Okay. I don't know if that's like something we weren't supposed to really say because of No. Who cares? Who cares? Ownership is nine tenths of the law. Hmm. Um, I... I One dollar. Oh, that's our joke. I wonder if... uh, if it's clear, like this movie edited, we edited this movie for six months, was it? Like we yeah, wrapped, at least, maybe seven. We wrapped the movie July in July, July, and we edited until most expensive phone in the probably world. until Berlin, and and even past that, I guess seven months. Yeah, seven say? months. And do you do you think that was enough time, or do you think that we needed way more? Only because we had that assembly edit, and because it was scripted as much as it was. Which I guess usually movies are. So, I, I would say, yeah. Like I think we needed. I think we needed one more month. What? Well, then we could have uncovered some things that we have for the series that we've decided we wish we had in the movie. Yeah, yeah, one more month to do it comfortably. And it was always the crazy, like, mad dash for whatever next deadline of like a test screening that we had to make. Why is it but uh, that was kind of good too. I think to always had that pressure to yeah. get a new version out. Yeah, constantly. We couldn't have done it without, obviously, your help as a director who actually helps physically edit. Yeah. You you, you talked to me about that once before, and it's something I'm painfully ignorant of. Like, what are nor- are are normal directors not editing? No, not usually. Not in my experience. Very often, it's just me, and then I'll send them, you know, scenes when I'm ready to show them, and then there's like a back and forth on what they think and giving notes, but in my experience, I haven't had other directors that actually sit down and are like really fantastic editors themselves, you know? So that's super helpful and truly the only way that this movie could get done as quick as it did and with the help of Bobby, like the huge team of editors. I was very blessed. Yeah. I, th- I guess people, uh, my, my impression is that people do not take editing seriously or as seriously as they should because from my perspective, Get me a meeting with Editing you is filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, obviously that shows in all of my work, which is, you know, clearly, clearly the focus is on the editing um, as opposed to other places. But, but that's because I believe that editing is like the magic of filmmaking. Like that's the thing that film can do that nothing else can do. Like mm-hmm. photography and images, those exist in other mediums, performance that act that exists in theater. Let's go, right, let's go. like the music, like it, all the other tools that a filmmaker uses, those are borrowed from other mediums. But the edit to, mm-hmm. to reassemble time. Yes, I remember being quite young and like, I forget what movie it was, some Judd Apatow movie. But I remember seeing some critic attacking it, being like, this is just like a play on camera. And so why is it a movie? Like, mm. you're not doing anything, you're just... Doing like shot and reverse shot, and then being like, here it is. These characters, you know, yeah, no, talking. It, it, and and it, so it's like you got to use, yeah, the language of film to your advantage you, to tell the story to. in a way you couldn't in another. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like, why is it a movie? And it needs mm-hmm. to be a movie so that you can use this tool, which has been given to us by God, <laughs> to do something remarkable. <laughs> and editing is that. It is. It is the ability to play with time, space, and reality itself, mm-hmm. and. It should it should get uh, uh, like if you're giving uh, uh, like if you have a hundred resources and you give you know you should be giving fifty of those resources to the edit like in terms of your mental energy your time I spend way more time editing than than anything else and way more attention to it and that actually in some ways allows me to kind of be a bit looser with the other elements of filmmaking, mm-hmm. whether it's you writing always or shooting. Have it. 
yeah, as a crutch. And something I was definitely Mr. Like, you guys better have a good plan this time around. When you go in, like, really try and think of what you want to happen and I get it exactly and like get that. it, you know, close or try. Um, but there's a there's a real good, hopefully, comfort in knowing when you're on set, if something's not going quite to plan, there's a great chance that that plan wasn't going to be what you went with anyways. So just let some stuff happen in, in, in that fact, feels right. One of the things that we learned on Nirvana the Band over and over again is that we would execute a plan, whether it's Jay taking speed and mm-hmm. then being really keyed up sure. or Jay, Jay taking downers and falling asleep. Like it, what I'm getting at is sometimes we would execute a plan well only to realize in the edit that we, we wish we had done it the opposite. Yeah. We wish we'd done it the exact opposite. And so you, I, it's, the lesson from that is difficult to learn because what does that mean? Do the opposite of what you think you should do? No. It means shoot in a way that maybe you could reinterpret that footage in your edit if you need to. Mm-hmm. Or at least be open to it when the yeah. time comes. And you do kind of need to cling to something, I'm sure, when you're on set. The password, Mike? You know, or else you'd feel totally... Am I required? Like, you, you know, to? you didn't have a guide on how to yeah. feel like you got it and move on. But, yeah, I think it's good to um, know it's not the end of the world if things didn't work out the way it was in your head. Right, and and maybe it's a blessing because you yeah. might be able to pivot from that into something way better than you could have ever thought of. And mm-hmm. even this that- is a good example. This is like the only day I was on set, this NHL scene, and I remember this shot specifically. People were stressed out, being like, "Ah, where are we gonna get it? Jim. Like, get coverage of this? You know, do we have nothing to cut to and stuff? Remember this? Of we course, were worried. Maybe it wasn't this exact moment, but it was. No, it was Jim. It was. Yeah, waiting to go in the in here in one of the scenes and it was like some big time stress of like ah what are we going to cut to if we need to condense time and like there was all that stress and then in the edit it's like what this is too long let's just lose all this shit of him looking at the phone <laughs> just yeah. to have him go in what and man that's i remember something i i said to you too right beforehand i didn't have a ton of advice to give but it was like in my experience up until that point so often as an editor you just want to get through stuff as quick as you can because you're like on set, maybe it feels like it makes sense that he's like pacing and waiting and looking at his phone and doing stuff. But it's like, again, time when you're sitting in an audience or when you're watching a movie is like so expanded. You, you get it so quick and you don't want to have to linger in just nothing or else you're watching uh, um, Tar. Just kidding. I know you yeah. love Tar. Dude, tar, no, I'm a Tar hater. No, yeah, I'm a Tar hater. I, I, tar has some beautiful moments, but it is it's, it's indulgent. You got it. It's you got to load the audience. I think with something new, enough new, before every time you're about to linger for a long time. There's no hate on Tar from me. But. And you know what? That's oh, that's only if you're trying to make you know, like commercial. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, like style filmmaking. Like if, yeah. if you if you're if you're trying to do. You know, whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was a good example, though, of Jim waiting. Like, that's something we changed from Berlin to this final cut, which was we had Jim pacing and waiting a lot longer. But we were like, what are we doing? Making an audience just sit and, like, wait and think, like, you know, what the runtime is at that point in the movie and how much is left. It's like, just keep things moving. Okay, that line. I'm from Waterloo where the vampires hang out. Kurt, what's the origin of it? Uh, the true origin or how did it make in the movie? Go, 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 go. Mm. Never make it. The true origin is from a viral video of a guy who's unfortunately, I think, in a what bad place, a bit of a <laughs> mental breakdown, <laughs> and he's saying a lot of interesting things, and that's a line that he says in this interview that's happening. And I think our gang has known that video for a long time and loved it. And when it came time to making this movie about Waterloo, it just seemed very obvious that that's a line that needed to make its way in at some point. And... We found the perfect spot. Yeah. It seems to be getting love. <laughs> I think it is probably a pretty fun thrill for people who don't know where it came from and then they discover it later. But it's got the it's got the feeling. And I had friends that uh, saw the movie and came up to me and were like, where's that line from? Because you can tell it's something. Even if you don't know it's from something or what it's from, like it's so unique and bizarre that it's got just – you know, if you don't know what it's from, you know you're missing something and you want to know. Well, that's the brilliance of an inside joke. Is that yeah. the, great, the great inside jokes actually invite people in. 
Yeah. <laughs> and somehow everybody wants to be in on it and not outside of it. Yeah. It's for multi-million dollar stock for us. Unfortunately, Mike Lazaridis was always on the outside of every inside joke. Yeah. Okay, I swear I had no, I had no idea about any of what you just said. Do you expect me to believe that? This was another editing decision where sometimes this is so obvious. It's like I, I go, I'm going to go to director's commentary jail for saying this. But what oftentimes, the decision an editor makes is to not cut something. Proceed. And this is a great example how Kurt just doesn't ever cut to the SEC officer and just holds on Jay for that entire scene, and it makes it so much more interesting. Because, That's just it. yeah, so much too, I think, of an editor's job, especially with how we shoot stuff, which is a lot of like, you know, random tries at things. It's taking things and being like, okay, this. This was the intention. Look at this. Here's the choice that's being made. And just watching like a choice play out makes you feel like, oh, this must be what they intended. This it gives a feeling of like control that I think is nice. This this shot's another perfect example of this. Like like we have Glenn go through this extremely complicated blocking just to land right into this shot. Mm -hmm. And then we stay in it. We don't cut mm -hmm. to anything. Again, you need an actor like Glenn who can... Yeah, do it. who can hold the audience's attention? Yeah, but should we talk? Yeah. About, should we talk about how when we were editing, Bobby suggested that we do some reframing? Like, I wonder if that's an interesting point to bring up or not. Like in this moment, you mean like punching in on this stuff? You mean or what? It... No, I'm talking about literally uh, the decision to go uh, two to one. Why? So that we could reframe. Oh, we're in trouble with the SEC. Well, I think there was always a bit of a, a thought that that's how we would. No, no, I know that. Present it in the end, but but yes, I mean, re those bars help us a lot. Yeah, because it's not just that we're like editing picture. We're also trying to to use the frame to highlight certain things or to. Mm -hmm. Get the audience to notice certain things, and by yeah. shoot, by shooting full frame, and then doing a two to one conversion, or even a like a two three five yeah, the conversion. Sense of pan and scan is that the right term? Like just us using keyframes to constantly, while a shot's going, you know, bring the frame up or down to showcase, to just to make it a better shot. Off yeah. throughout. And, and also to like to focus on certain things in the frame that maybe we didn't know were going to be important. Yeah. Yeah. AT&T knows exactly. A fun fact, when Jim was walking in to the parking lot, Doug's parking sign was still there because having his sign get taken down was one of the reshoots we did. Yeah, we didn't, so, we, we didn't think about that until after. Yeah. <laughs> Who's that? But we didn't say uh, what the big reshoot was for the opening of the movie. <laughs> so that shot of Jay Baruchel in the closet on the phone saying the SEC is here. And they're coming to get us. That was a huge reshoot. Like we went and shot, uh, and, and shot a whole, a whole day scene, which was going to be the opening of the movie. Yeah, and then all that, all that survived from it was, uh, was that moment. And it was going to be Mike basically planting all these seeds of what was going to happen through the movie and what was going to be important. Like the SEC's like, tell us about Jim, and he's like, well, Jim's like this. He's a shark. He's Got all these wants. He wants to own an NHL team. It's things that we, it was kind of going to be a big crutch for us, I think. Stuff yeah. that we didn't know if it was really playing well throughout. And then, yeah, I think we realized it was that things first, were working. It was that first screening that we did of the movie yeah. where people were just like, they followed everything and they all loved they Jim. Got it. Yeah. And we thought people were going to hate Jim. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I always knew people were going to love him. Look at that move. That's Even, I know. <laughs> so good. When he just walks out, oh. Even that, I remember there's different moments of like, are people going to get it, what that means? But I think everyone gets What's it. What's so beautiful about this scene is that that is the best acting from Glenn in the whole movie, and this is the best acting from Jay in the yeah. whole movie. Yeah, and we're weird. able to cut from one to the other. Oh, yeah. look at that little move with his mouth. Oh, my God. I know. It's quite nice. This guy's like so the... good. <laughs> I know. Look at him. Look, look at this guy. He's so fucking good. <laughs> JB. JB. It's ridiculous. 
Here's we're a very lucky. Move. Oh yeah, it's a stitch. A nice score by Jay. We're very lucky that uh, the performers lent themselves to our little movie. Yeah. Had it just been you and who else? If it, had been, if it had been me, Jay McCarroll, and Owen Williams, yeah. I, I, I think would we'd be. This would be a DVD commentary, not a Blu-ray. Yeah. This would be a podcast. That's right. <laughs> This is another example of, like, I random was... Random footage. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah this is a random footage that I just cut together, and I was like, hey, if I cut together this footage of extras soldering things together, it seems very alienating, doesn't it? This that is one of the thing. last things edited in the film, that, that little sequence just then. She's holding the, the thing solder. a little too far down. Yeah. Well, we changed it. Yeah, I know, I know. This is something Bar Barbie, Bobby and I always marveled at, that you guys went to the lengths of going to China and shipping all these boxes to, Sometimes to Canada. Like, that must have cost so much. It was millions. Because <laughs> because those boxes are all full of Blackberry storms. Like That's so crazy. In retrospect, I like I was told that we could have done this just with um, science. Mm. Science. We're number one in science. <laughs> what's in it? Oh no! What's what? It what be? is in it? Whoa! They're doing CDs now. Oh, I thought it was going to be the Doug's, reveal. No, the Doug's reveal head. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. It's my my head Gosh. looking up at him. <laughs> this was so He's lucky. Happy. I'm so happy this didn't have this, to be a VFX shot. Yeah, that we could really real. just have Jay <laughs> fuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck is wrong with my machine? This now, what's close. happening here? He's not clicking hard enough. I know these phones really didn't work so great, but like Jay must be doing us some favors here. I honestly think that he was doing it for real. <laughs> I don't think that he was like um, clowning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on that, it's crazy. He did, He's he not clicking hard enough, it. right? I click. think. I, I think. Yeah, he wasn't clicking hard enough. Is what I think. Yeah. Did you guys know that this made sense? Like that a phone would be buzzing. What do you mean? Did for I a certain know? Reason? Every, well, I, I, people fought me every step of the way. You know why I made it buzz? Because that's the only way audiences were going to get it. And you know what though? I asked my brother. We had the Canadian premiere. Matt Lobb, shout out. Yeah. And I was like, does that shit make sense? He's a two-way radio technician, and he told me exactly why that could be happening with the phone. And I oh, was good. Like, Thank God. Good. Yeah. But look, it didn't uh, at least matter. I hope he was right, or else now he's going to look foolish. But this stuff, yeah, it didn't matter. You're right. It's like to a what, what, common what, audience what, member. That just yeah, what of, audiences need is something that's extremely gettable. Like yeah. they want to just be able to grok what's happening and go, yeah. oh yeah. yeah and yeah. so long as it's not completely absurd, it's it's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Now tell the story about the the I guess kind of famous Waterloo train that used to go by the rim office. Well, it was important to us that so in actual research in motion, a train would rip right by the factory that mm -hmm. would take their finished things or bring in their finished devices and take them into the United States, etc. Mm -hmm. And this train was a very famous Canadian train. And, and uh, for the VFX of it, where did you guys get that train element? Was we, that... sh we shot it from the G to G, the Guelph to Godrich line. Yeah. Um, and so we filmed it. You'll see it's coming in in a second. And then Tristan just placed that train in the background. And so that yeah, is, that's, so good. yeah, it's not bad. And what, I mean, I know I was involved in the thinking of it, but I want to hear from you, like placing it where you do when the train comes by. Was that uh, you mean in, in, in time or <laughs> yeah like after like a specific moment in the shot Mike is just there is a there is a there's definitely a big story a long story that could be told about why that exact moment um, but but I think I'd like to leave some things up to yeah, yeah, to fair. discover yeah, that's fair. it's a VFX shot on the screen the actual Wait. movie playing was big yeah, Big is, is playing on that screen. And it's like the one and only time we got a little smack. It's, they said, no, that's not fair use, folks. 
This is Kurt's idea. Kurt's idea was to put this photograph at the end. This is just random, a random close-up shot by Adam Crosby, the B unit operator. And uh, Kurt was like, we should end the movie with that. It'll be beautiful. It's another late addition to the edit. That's always days. a good feeling, too. You were saying, like, did we have enough time on this movie? I think in the end we did feel like we did. Like, those little things were happening at the very end. We're like, oh, thank you. We had enough time to figure out those little things. Maybe there was a ton more we could have if we had more time. But Well, you never, yeah. The, you never know. All, all art is just abandoned. The, the, Steve yeah. Jobs has a great, great line about this, which is, real artists ship. Hmm. And, yeah. It's way better to have a finished movie that is, you know, 80% than an unfinished movie that might be 100% one day, but will never, ever be finished or released. It's the enemy of good. Dude, it's, J Jim is completely right. Perfect is the enemy of good. And as a filmmaker, if you are out there being like, oh, I'm going to make a movie, settle for good. Settle Yeah, and then you good. get to make another movie. And yes, exactly. Because the, 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 the ultimate product is not your film. The ultimate product is you. And the goal is for you to become better by making more and more movies, by learning more and more about editing, cinematography, whatever, like what, like whatever type of filmmaker you want to be, you will only get better at it by doing it and releasing that work into a public space. Mm -hmm. And the number of filmmakers that Kurt and I have seen who basically just wait for perfect conditions or think that they need more money or whatever, they'll wait forever. They'll wait forever. <laughs> you, you have to just go and, and do it and hope that your 80% is going to be better than, than, or at least that your 80% will have something to say. Mm -hmm. bum, 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 bum. Wow. That was the movie, man. This went pretty quick. I know. It's amazing how when you're doing these commentaries, this just flies by. Zips. Yeah. yeah. I hope people learned something. You know who I got my shout out to? I did on Alp Ave. And then, like, <laughs> as soon as it was released, instantly, he's like, thanks for the shout out. Dave Davidson. Oh, we'll give a nice shout out to said, Dave He's Davidson. the only one listening still by now. Oh, yeah, Dave. Thank you for that, Dave. Dave, I hope you liked this one. Um, I've, we're obviously trying to put more uh, internet style work into our films, as you can see. And, yeah, um, was. and we'll be asking you what you thought of it when we see you next. And you know what? It'd be pretty funny if my wife was watching this and then I'm like, there's one last person I got to give a special shout out to. If you think your wife and is then ever, Dave, ever. She's never going to. Watch I have to say uh, thank you to her and my kids for uh, allowing your, me to your put the kids? time. They're going to watch this one day all around the TV when I tell them, okay, kids, you're old enough now to, to watch, watch the, the commentary. Blu -ray commentary. <laughs> uh, they're not gonna yeah, but you da you need s support of people in your life to do this stuff because oh, that's for sure. When I say and when we say we took seven months to edit it, that means seven months truly straight. Did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that means seven months every single day. Yeah, Bobby was sleeping on a couch for five months. Yes, in in the editing station. We so. can't give enough love to Bobby. Couldn't have him without him. We love you, Bobby. Bobby's he's just in, right now. Yeah, so he couldn't do it with us, but. The commentary that is let's hope that by the time this has come out he's asked jocelyn to marry him otherwise oh he should sit her down to watch this and this is the proposal and then he, she turns around and he's jocelyn on will you marry me <laughs> um he, yeah yeah it's like a romantic night it's like okay just sit down i got something to show you <laughs> they gotta watch the whole <laughs> thing the end, and they're just yeah. listening to this rambling nonsense yeah Here's my shout out. It's coming to the logo, to faux pop logo. Just to say that we edited at this faux pop station, the whole movie here in Goddard, Ontario. It's this old train station. And then it was yeah. just a cool, fun place. We were not in the city and it was just our little squad editing this movie. And actually and, it's uh, a good, a good little lesson about editing that sometimes you, you really do need to get away from all distractions and Kurt's editing station at that faux pop in Godrich, which is fucking far away from Toronto. Owned by, yeah. Randall Lobb and Mark Hussey, and I gotta say Mark and Isaac Fisher, but Mark Hussey is a post supervisor on the movie, and he also was a super huge asset and a reason why we could do this because, and all these different picture lock new versions, and so working with people who also support that all the crazy changes and don't just feel like nope, this was the movie we had this much time. It's Ooh. like work, work with people who will do what they can to let you 
make your best version of the movie. Because if you got instead the people who are supposed to be supporting you do that, telling you, nope, that's it, then you're toast. Mostly because they're motivated by either a desire oh. to be finished or a desire to deliver. And yeah. that that can be the death. That that's the difference between like what could be a, a good movie and a piece of shit. Is this it though? Do you have to wrap it up? Yeah. How much time do you have left? Yeah. No. That's it. We got it. So, so, hey, so thank you for listening and goodbye.